Welcome to episode six of the Haskell Cast. I'm Rain Henricks with Chris Forno. Our special guests today are Gabriel Gonzalez and Michael Snoyman. Gabriel Gonzalez works on the Pipes Library and the Errors Library and is the author of the Haskell for All blog. Michael Snoyman, Snoyman works on Yesod. I'm going to do that part again. <laughs> it's, this reminds me of the first of the first yes, episode. Yeah. Yesod. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is don't new. Worry, you won't, you this won't is, be the first person said yes. You don't yeah. have to worry. This is this is I'm, I have to do two people, so this is new and challenging for me. <laughs> Gabriel Gonzalez works on the Pipes Library and the Errors Library, and blogs at Haskell for All. Michael Snoyman works on Yesod and Conduit, and works at FP Complete on their IDE. I think I didn't screw that one up. Good job. Yes. Let us proceed. So we're here today mostly to talk about pipes and conduits. And I was joking with uh, Chris earlier that this would be a sort of Haskell Thunderdome where two Haskellers enter and then have a polite conversation and then they both leave. <laughs> so not, not the same kind of Thunderdome that maybe people are used to, but I think it'll still be a lot of fun. So let's maybe start with what is the problem that these libraries attempt to solve? Do they attempt to solve the same problem? And is that mostly lazy I.O.? Gabriel, could you maybe, I know you just blogged about this, maybe you could talk about that a bit. Yeah, I think these libraries sort of target different niches. Michael's focuses heavily on resource management, whereas Pipes focuses mainly on equational reasoning. Michael, fair? <laughs> it's definitely fair. Uh, I would also point out that I think the history of the libraries has a huge impact on where they come from. Conduit actually is very much based in the iterative and enumerator package history. Mm -hmm. uh, before I, before Yisod used Conduit, it was using enumerator. I was actually very happy with enumerator for m many of our use cases. We were just running into a few very corner cases that we were outgrowing, and that's where Conduit came from. It's almost accidental that Conduit and Pipes ended up converging towards very much the same design space. So, Gabriel, maybe we could talk a bit about some of the stuff you covered in your blog post for people here. What is the problem with lazy I.O.? So the issue with lazy I.O. is that you tie the order of side effects to the order of evaluation. And the problem is that when you do equational reasoning, formal reasoning about Haskell programs, the kind of manipulations you do will affect evaluation order and therefore change the order of effects. So I spent a lot of time doing formal proofs of Haskell programs, which involves rearranging terms. And for me, it helps when doing these proofs that I don't want to have to think about evaluation order. I just want these proofs to always hold. And so just getting rid, separating side effects from or evaluation makes reasoning about code much easier. OK. Now maybe what about a more familiar problem to some of our listeners, like reading in a file, processing it line by line, but being forced to read the entire file before they can start processing a single line? Is that also something that these libraries are attempting to solve? Yes. So yeah, both pipes and conduit make it try to make it so you can do stream processing, but without having to rely on lazy I/O for that purpose. That's correct. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. So, Chris, would you like to ask a yeah, question? Yeah, sure. So, Michael, I see that um, while Gabriel's pipes seem to focus a lot on. Uh, I'd say elegance in the type system and uh, equational reasoning. Uh, you put a lot of emphasis on some real world uh, concerns and things you've encountered. Can you give some idea of what those are? Sure. So it happens to be that a lot of the things that Gabriel just mentioned play into the real world very much. So, for example, if I'm, you know, this one came up very recently for me. If you're interacting with a socket, let's say you're processing an HTTP request, and the socket suddenly dies, you don't want your web application to just start processing on garbage data. You want the exception to be well handled when you're doing I.O. When you're dealing with lazy I.O., those exceptions can just pop up anywhere. The same thing can apply on the response side. So you want to make sure that you handle these things in a guaranteed way. That's one of the, that's one of the strong use cases for using a library like this. Uh, the other thing is composition. So at some point, I work, so I've worked both on 
the on the server side of HTTP with things like USOD and WARP, and also on the client side with HTTP conduit and now HTTP client. One of the use cases that we really want to be able to handle is a proxy server, where you take these two different components and you plug them together. We want deterministic resource handling, we want known memory usage, and we want these things to just compose together nicely, where you're able to say, okay, I'm going to take the request body coming in from this side and pass it right through, and the same thing with the response body. Those are the kinds of goals that we had. Uh, you know, the team of us that worked on Conduit, the initial designs, those were the kinds of things that we were trying to address when putting together the library. Okay, th this leads into something. Uh, we may be able to look at how these are similar before looking at how they're dissimilar, because I see uh, recently, uh, Gabriel, that you used some of this HTTP code from Conduit to implement pipes HTTP. Is that correct? So HTTP Conduit, Michael, so has a uh, Conduit independent subset that Michael factored out into the HTTP client and HTTP client TLS libraries. So Pipes was reusing that. So And so what Michael did there is he, instead of providing a source, he provided an IO action that returns a byte string. It's a little bit similar to the IO streams interface, except without the pushback component. And so Pipes was able to reuse that, and just write a, a thin pipe wrapper around that IO byte string action, just to make, turn it into a producer. Okay. Rain, yeah, you can go ahead. I, just, I, I would just throw in that that's not the only place where these libraries have been able to reuse a lot of the same components. So another example that pipes, conduit, and IO streams, possibly others, oh, it also enumerator, was zlib bindings. The ability to have a low-level API to talk, you know, to deal with an iterative process of building, of doing either compression or decompression, but then layering up a much higher level API on top of that. That's one of the great things about having multiple packages being worked on. It does, it does spread resources out a little bit, but on the flip side, you have a whole bunch of people who are trying to solve a lot of the same problems. We're able to get together and solve them well together. And also there was the recent thing where we, we now share the text encoding, decoding stuff. Yeah. Right. And also, I want to take this opportunity just to remind you, uh, so the Foldout library is written in such a way that it can interoperate with any streaming library. So I, I really suggest that you add a, like a little a thin conduit wrapper around that so you don't have to actually depend on the Foldout library to interoperate with it. So I just wanted to mention that. What? I saw it in a Stack Overflow, and I forgot to bookmark it. So I'm bookmarking it now, and I won't forget it. <laughs> OK, good. So this sort of brings up an interesting question for me. There are already some existing libraries that do similar things. Uh, how did you both decide to write your own library, and, and how did you both decide to not use the other library? Is it sort of like a Leibniz-Newton thing that happened, or...? Can I feel this one? So we both pretty much <laughs> independently had the same idea at the same time. So yeah. we both were not aware of each other's idea, at least I wasn't, until we both had basically... Had, I think it was like a few months in. Uh, we both started realizing the other person was doing almost the exact same thing. Uh, so that's how we ended up com independently converging on the same idea. Well, actually, I mean, the fact of the matter is that Conduit started off very different than where it ended up. The original yeah. goals of Conduit were, let's just see if we can get something that addresses the problems that we were hitting with Enumerator. I'll go into the details if you're interested. But originally, there's no concept of let's try to do this in an elegant manner or a pure manner. Let's just see, let's explore the design space. Let's go for something totally radically different and see if that works. And then, as if you, if you actually go to the Conduit uh, hackage page, you can see the version history. And you can see it starts off very imperative, very stateful. And it's slowly, slowly, you know, as you get to 0 0.5 and then 1.0, it just became much more pure. And if it, it was actually the 0 0.4 release where uh, who was it? Twan, yeah, Twan put up a blog post saying, hey, yeah. by the way, I noticed that Conduit could actually have almost exactly the same data types as pipes. Mm -hmm. And to this day, the core data type in Conduit is actually called pipe. And it has almost exactly the same constructors. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very close to each other. And analyzing the differences between the two of them actually lets you know a lot of the differences in philosophy between the two libraries. Can I summarize briefly the difference between the internal implementations? Sure. So the main difference is that Michael includes in the constructors fields for holding finalizer information. So you can integrate resource management with pipe termination and cleanup. 
Whereas the main extra bell and whistle that Pipes has is bidirectional information flow. So if you just sort of like factor those things out, the two implementations are very, very similar. Well, actually, there are two others. There's left leftover handling. Oh, that's handling, right, leftovers. Leftover handling. And then actually, the very I think the one that might be more interesting is the fact that in Conduit, you're able to detect upstream termination. So in Conduit, you're able to say, give me another value from upstream. And if there isn't one, let me know that too. Mm -hmm. as opposed to in pipes, where when you await for a value from upstream, the pipe automatically terminates if there isn't anything available. Correct. The, the pipes analog of uh, await notification and leftover support is in pipes parse. It's not part of the core pipe data type. That's correct. I'd like for us to talk about leftovers and possibly finalizers a little bit uh, later, but you, you've hit on an issue here with the types being very similar. Uh, is that basically the difference you're talking about between the these uh, general proxy and conduit M types? Yes, that's correct. Okay. It, it, it also gets a little bit confusing when you uh, when you initially look at pipes and see producers, consumers, and pipes, and you see sources, sinks, and conduits, but then also producers, consumers, and pipes in the conduit library. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to comment on that, that Michael. Uh, sure. Uh, so sources, sinks, and, con and conduits are the primary type synonyms. The fact is that everything is just one data type. There's one data type, it's conduit M. That's the only thing that people are really interacting with. There are conveniences to make the, uh, the, t the error messages and to make the uh, haddocks a little bit more easy to work with. One of the very interesting things that ended up happening in the development of conduit was that originally we actually did have three different types. We had conduit, source, and sync, and they were separate. Eventually, we converged them into a single type. Then you get into an interesting question. Let's say that you want to be able to read values out of a file. You want to read bytes out of a file. Is that a source? Well, if you say it's a source, then you can't use it as a conduit. Because you're, what you've said by saying it's a source is that there's no, there are no values coming from upstream. There is no upstream. A source is always the most upstream component. So instead, and so that would limit us. We then have to have two different versions of let's read values from a file, which we don't want to, we don't want to do. Right, we don't want to do that. We want to be able to reuse the same function. So instead, we have this producer type, which is, which uses rank n two types, and it just says we don't care what the upstream is. There may be an upstream, there may not be an upstream. It's completely irrelevant. Same thing with consumer. There might be a downstream, there may not be a downstream, but this can be used as either a conduit or a sink. Same thing with the producer it can be either a source or a conduit. So it, so yeah, there are there are these five different type synonyms, but the core type synonyms are really just three, and under the surface, it's all just one type anyway. And, and Gabriel, I hope that clarified. I didn't make it more confusing. No, I was just going to ask Gabriel how how does that uh, does does pipes have a similar concept? I'm, I'm pipes does the exact same thing as conduit. So uh, I don't remember off the top. So so pipes has a. Uh, you know, three main types in them, producer, pipe, and consumer. Those are just type synonyms around the underlying proxy type. Uh, I think Michael has something similar to pipes where we have like concrete and polymorphic versions of types in oh no, type synonyms, yeah, I think that's right. And uh, yeah. that's just mainly to deal with some problems with uh, higher rank types. But other than that, it's the same principle as conduit. Okay. There, there's one other uh, similarity I noticed at, at the core of these libraries is they, they both have the await and yield functions, if I, if I remember correctly. Did you converge on those names and, and the, the functionality? Uh, are, are they effectively the same in each library? So I know where I got mine from, which was a really wonderful uh, um, article written by Mario Blazevic, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, in the Monad Reader issue 19. So that article he wrote, which is on a, it was on a coroutines, uh, really inspired me. And that was what got me really into the idea of making pipes. And I just stole the names away and yield from that article. And I stole the names from Gabriel. <laughs> uh, the, fact, the fact is the conduit in the earlier versions looked totally different. And there's a huge advantage to having you know similar names throughout these libraries, so there's you know it would just be ridiculous to take any time I've had an opportunity to take the names that Gabriel's used, I've done that, and I haven't. I don't think I've been needed to apologize. I hope not. I to, no, you know, I, I, I don't mind. 
you know, it's, I think it's a good thing for the community that we're going ahead and converging on similar concepts, similar names. Where there are differences, we have to be clear about the differences. We don't want people to get confused that there are two yield functions and they do slightly different things. That would be a bad thing. But as long as everything's well documented, having similar names, I think, is overall a win. Yeah, agreed. I, I was going to ask you about this a little bit later, but we can talk about it now. Do you see um, a future in which you've converged on a similar design, or you see the possibility of one of these libraries winning out, or are we going to end up with a case like errors, where we have you know eight ways of dealing with these things? I think the best solution is just to divide a conversion wrapper. I don't really believe in monolithic one winner takes all solution. So I think the most realistic solution would be like something that converts upgrades a pipe to a conduit, since conduit is more fully featured than a pipe, than just a vanilla pipe, for example. So I, that would probably be the easiest way to get compatibility between the two ecosystems. I would def I mean I would definitely be in favor of converging if possible. Uh, the fact is that we do have very different goals with these libraries. It just so happens that they're very close together. Uh, if there was a way, so I'll give you one example. Finalizers comes up quite a bit, and I was actually I actually played around with it last week, and I realized that if we're willing to give up one or two features in Conduit, we could drop the explicit finalizer functionality. If that was the only thing necessary to get pipes in Conduit to converge, I'd probably do it. At this point, though, it's just not worth you know the the pain of another backwards incompatible update mm -hmm. to do something like that. But I'm very interested in pursuing ways that we can you know, share, share similar ideas. Pipes parse, for example, has me very interested. Uh, and we can go into, I'm sure we're going to talk, uh, talk about that a little bit more later in the talk, in this uh, cast. But Pipes parse is really introducing some new concepts and new ways of doing things that model all of the functionality of Conduit. So I'm interested to see where that goes. If that turns out good and we're able to figure out a way to, to converge on that, I'd be very happy. I have no particular desire that we have to have two libraries. But for the meantime, I don't think that either one of them is going away. So let's talk about a thing that's totally my idea, uh, which is uh, pipes parse. <laughs> <laughs> totally a question I had in my own mind just now, and not the thing that you just. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what is new and exciting about pipes parse, and and why should people care about that? So. I think the interesting thing is Pipes Parse shows how lenses plus pipes comes really close to the original API Michael envisioned for Conduit. And because when I was coming up with Pipes Parse, I wasn't actually trying to copy Conduit. It was just I just noticed that lenses had these nice properties when you in conjunction with state T. And then I found that there was a very close one-to-one -one mapping on Conduit types and operations. And so that's, that's what got me really excited about Pipes Parse. The thing that interests me is that, as someone who came originally from the iterative and enumerator background, I actually see pipes parse, pipes and conduit, and enumerator filling out a spectrum very nicely. You have pipes and conduit that sit in the middle, where you have upstream, you have you know producers, consumers, transformers, and all of them are first class citizens. All of them are all of them are coroutine based. All of them are able to pause themselves, and so on and so forth. You have the iterative design, which is based on a left fold. And in that, in that concept, there's, no, there's really no such core concept as a data producer. The only thing you have is a data consumer. A data consumer is, a, is then transformed by an enumerator. That's, right. I know I'm being very vague and abstract, but uh, I don't want to spend the next two hours talking about it. But then on the flip side, you have pipes parse. And pipes parse went the opposite direction. It took pipes. It, basically reduces pipes down to the concept of a producer only. That's right. The producer is now coroutine based. And the parser is now transforming the producer. So it's essentially the exact opposite of what enumerator did. And I find it very interesting that both of those things ended up being just as powerful as each other. And I'm curious to see which one of them comes out with a nicer API in the end. Yeah, Gabriel, can you, can you uh give us a more concrete idea of what pipes parse is for? I, the, the name implies parsing. Is that, uh, is that the only use case? So that's the primary use case, yes. So pipes parse solves two features which the vanilla pipes implementation does not have. One of those is leftover support, 
and the other one is the ability to be notified when upstream is out of input. Because right now, if you await and upstream doesn't handle the await, you don't you don't regain rich control. So draw would be the pipes parse the equivalent of await, and draw returns a nothing if upstream is out of input. And those two things tend to fit very well into parsing, so that's why I call it mainly a parsing library. I don't tend to use it for things other than parsing. So I mean, maybe other people do, but I don't. That's why I call the library pipes parse. And where does uh, where does Lens fit in there? Why did you use Lens? So you know, conduit has the connective operations. You know, you can connect a source to a conduit, a conduit to a sink, and so forth. The Lens operations course. So two of those operations correspond to Lens operations. So like in conduit, when you connect a source to a conduit, the so the pipes parse analog of that operation is view from Lens. In conduit, when you connect a conduit to a sink. The lens operation that is the analog of that is zoom. And in conduit, when you connect a source to a sink, the analog of that is, is not from lens. That's e, uh, eval state T. And so that's the other the third connective. So you talked earlier about your intention to use equational reasoning tools to prove the properties of pipes. Um, could, you, could you talk a bit more about how you do that, sort of what what context those proofs are in, or do you formalize the, the, the system in some way? Like, do you, do you consider Hask and then go from there? Or how do those proofs look? So these proofs are primarily, so I don't, I'm not rigorous in the sense that I define like precise categories such as Hask and then, you know, you know ensure it's a total subset of Haskell. I mainly just do uh, pretty informal equational reasoning, just do substitution. Right. Uh, I've been doing things where taking the pipes proofs and putting them into Agda, and that exposes like some of the flaws in co-induction. Mm -hmm. And so Paolo Capriotti has been helping me work through those things so we can make it more precise. And so I, I can I could talk a lot about that, but that would probably take a long time. Uh, so that's what I so part of the pr purpose of equational reasoning is just to prove the library fulfills its contract. Mm -hmm. But second is that you can also prove uh, higher level properties. For example, it, you know, one of the things that, Pi that Michael did in discussing his ideas for pipes parse is that he implemented like a thing that lets you uh, propagate leftovers further upstream using conduit. And it was actually very similar to uh, something that I had prototyped earlier uh, for, for propagating leftovers upstream not using state T in lenses. And that implementation, because it was built on top of pipes, I could prove that implementation satisfied the category laws very succinctly because I, it built on top of existing pipes proofs. And then because of that, it suggests very strongly that what Michael has right now does in fact form a category, at least the parsing subset. So that's an example of how you can use pipes to prove higher level properties very rapidly. So when I think about equational reasoning in Haskell, I, I mostly think about Richard Byrd and especially his yes. uh, Pearls of Functional Algorithm Design book. And one of the really interesting things that he does in that book is he uses equational reasoning to improve the performance of his algorithms, either constant factor improvements or even asymptotic improvements. Do you find any of those as you're working with pipes? Yes, I actually wrote a post about this. It's called uh, the string fusion for pipes, where mm -hmm. I basically take one of the equations and I use it to, and that, it turns out that these, the equation is a category law, also technically a monad law for the equivalent Cleasley category. Mm -hmm. and then. I apply this equation not only as a correctness proof, but also as an optimization. So it turns out these three category laws correspond to optimization rules for stream fusion, and Pipes uses that to uh, eliminate intermediate stages as much as possible. Now, I've always been impressed by it, by that use of equational reasoning in Haskell, and it seems almost magical to me because in, in most other languages that I use, you just can't do that because you don't have uh, guarantees about the referential transparency of, of the function so you don't know what they can actually do and things like that. So when I see A equals B but B is faster than A, so just put B there, I kind of go, wow, that's it's amazing to me that, that Haskell is a language that's powerful enough to allow you to do that kind of thing. So uh, Michael, you mentioned earlier that you were working with one of the precursor libraries. Was it Iterates or was it uh, Enumerators? I used Enumerator. And what was, what drove you to replace it? Where did it kind of fall off for you? So the initial, I would say that there, actually, if you go, still, if you go to the Conduit README, 
there's still a massive section about a numerator because that was describing the different reasons. But if I were to narrow it down, it would probably come down to two things. One is that there was a really steep learning curve for a numerator. Uh, I actually ended up, the only time I actually finally felt like I understood a numerator was after I wrote a three part tutorial on how to use a numerator. <laughs> the time I finished that, I kind of felt like I started to understand what was going on there. So the concept, I, I definitely thought that there was a way to do this in a more user friendly way. Uh, that wasn't enough to push me over the edge that I write a new library. The, the issue was, what I'd mentioned earlier in this talk, was that uh, each, someone trying to write, it was actually Eric de Castro Lopa, I remember this. He was trying to write HTTP proxy based on warp and HTTP enumerator. And eventually we came to the conclusion that if you had a two stacked iterity going you know, in each direction, one going to the client, one going to the server, you could sort of get it to work, and at that point, those of us who were in the in that email thread just decided maybe we should look at going a different route. So the first function, the first piece of functionality actually that Conduit got was something called Connect and Resume. And Connect and Resume is actually it's not a it's not a particularly impressive piece of functionality. All it says is I'm going to take this data source, I'm going to connect it to this data sync, and by the way, when I when this sync is all done, I want to be able to reuse the source later on. It's not particularly amazing. It's pretty simple. But it just allowed whole classes of new programs to be written without breaking our heads open. You were able to start, instead of having to have your entire program live in the iterating monad, you were now able to just live in the IO monad like normal, and you were able to pass around your data source. So it transformed the way that we were able to start thinking about writing programs. Uh, the USODE code base became much simpler. The warp code base became much simpler during that uh, process. Actually, I just wrote a. Uh, we were just talking about bracket in a completely different uh, package, talking about the exceptions package. And one of the things you can't do is you can't write bracket inside a coroutine-based monad like iterity. So having this ability to separate things out means you're able to do more powerful things. Uh, I definitely, it was definitely, uh, you know, whole new realms of possibility opened up once we started moving towards conduit. So you mentioned uh, right. disconnecting and reconnecting a source. Uh, I think it's resumable source. Can you give an example of when yeah. when that would be useful? Uh, so an example. Let's let's think. Okay. So inside inside of, uh, the warp web server, you might want to do. You would do something like this. Mm -hmm. I have a source representing the incoming connection from a client. I want to parse all of the request headers inside warp itself. Warp has to be able to handle that. So I'm going to parse that. And then at the end, I'm going, to, I'm going to have everything that's left in the string. There might be some leftover chunk of data that will include some of the requ request body. And then there will be other chunks that I haven't read yet from the, uh, from the client. I want to be able to take that source, and I need to give it in some way or another to the application. Because the application is now going to re receive a 12 megabyte request body that it wants to be able to handle in constant space. So how do you do that? So the old way of doing this, before we had connect and resume, was to say, OK, everything is going to live inside the same iterating monad. And you have to deal, you, you have to play a little bit of a game to make sure that the request body is completely consumed. That's not too complicated. But the thing that does become tricky is resource handling and exception handling. Because once you're in this iterative coroutine-based system, you can't write exception safe code without some assistance. You have to, and that, that's another topic. That's, a, that's the resource T topic or pipe safe topic. Uh, but you can't do it anymore. Uh, so, what we do nowadays in Warp is we connect to this sync that reads in all of the request lines, the request headers, and then everything that's left over is now a source that can once again be passed into the application. And the application just lives in the IO monad, which helps us greatly for efficiency. We actually, Warp 2.0 got a huge per performance boost by making a few changes to get us back into the IO monad itself. So you get, per you get uh, efficiency. It's easier to understand the library. Unless you're dealing with the request body, you don't have to think about the request body. It's, I think it's just a better approach. And without connect and resume, you can't do it. So this is a, a two-part question for both of you. Uh, Michael, your conduit library is getting direct use in Yesode and, and Warp. Uh, have you found that to be useful in driving the, the features and making it easier to figure out what to prioritize for developing conduit? And also for Gabriel, 
what are some of the the users and consumers of of the pipes family of of uh, libraries, and do you have the same kind of users driving your development of pipes? Gabriel, you want to go first? I just okay. I'll go that. first. Yeah. So pipes. In my case, the the number one use case that came up mm -hmm. and the reason I made the library was my graduate uh, thesis work on uh, a structural search engine. And so that's what drove a lot of its initial design. And then right now, so because of that, it tends to be used heavily by people who do like bioinformatics or just general data processing. It's not used very much in the web world right now. So, so I mean, that may improve a little bit with the with the addition of Pipes HTTP, but there is no Pipes-based server. Uh, so those are the main consumers of Pipes right now. Mm -hmm. And Michael, the question for you was how has the use in Yesod and Warp driven the development of Conduit, basically. So initially, the entire feature set of Conduit was driven by Yesod and, Con and Warp. That that was it. There's nothing else. I would say since the maybe the 0 0.3 days, that hasn't been the case at all. Essentially, as far as Warp and Yesod are concerned, Conduit is feature complete. We have no need for anything else. There's been no there's been no significant change in the library. That we've that you know I've said now I can write this Yesod feature that I've always wanted to have. It hasn't happened. Instead, most of the features that are coming in are from new. I'd say probably brand new use cases. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'm doing at work uh, for FP Complete beyond our IDE work, we also are getting into some new domains and we're writing a lot of data analysis uh, libraries. So the ability to perform analyses on multiple cores at the same time, to be able to take a stream and split it up. Those are the kinds of uh, functionality. Uh, I've received pull requests with such things as being able to do a zip sync. So if you're familiar with zip list, it provides an alternative applicative instance uh, versus the normal applicative instance for lists. So we then have the same thing for, uh, for sync and zip sync, which allows you to uh, consume a stream in parallel. And that, of course, you know, once you have zip sync, of course, you have to have zip source and zip conduit, which we now have as well, because, because you know, why not? Uh, those, those are a lot of the kinds of things that we've ended up adding. Uh, just a completely random one I'll throw in there is we've, for a long time, we've had something called lazy source, which is, and uh, you know, I, I don't like lazy IO, so right at the top of the module it says, please don't use this, please try to figure out some other way. But if you're really stuck using a lazy IO based library like the tar library, you can go ahead and you can use this. And uh, so we're trying to find a lot of integration points with the way people are already doing things and adapt to those uh, to those kinds of circumstances. So it seems like Conduit is is building a pretty rich ecosystem of people who are writing Conduit-based libraries. I see the, there's a CouchDB client, there's CSV parsing, there's even a there's a there's a set of vector utilities, there's an image size and image information parsing library. Lots of different things are being built on top of Conduit, it seems sort of a testament to the, the flexibility of these, these libraries that so many different things are being done with them. Where do you see the development of Conduit going, and, and what kind of new use cases are, are, are you finding that maybe you didn't expect when you started writing the library? New use cases. Uh, so definitely, one of the things that I've noticed is as far as core functionality, nothing's really changed. Uh, you know, the, the thing, and actually, you know, the distinctions between pipes and conduit come into play here. Having the ability to determine when upstream is done, handle resources, all of those things were the original, uh, the original design goals of conduit. And most of the functionality that you just mentioned all fit inside that same feature set. Most of the stuff we're adding these days is just conveniences. So for example, uh, this is an idea that we got from the pipes world. Uh, we now have a data.conduit.lift mod uh, module, which allows you to deal with monad transformers in a specific component of a pipeline. Uh, that doesn't provide any functionality that you couldn't have done some other way. It just would have been incredibly irritating to do it previously. Same way that you know, if you had a state T monad and I said to you, you know, please get rid of that transformer, you would have you could have done it. It just would have been difficult. So. Those are the kinds of things that, that are getting added right now. It's most, I, I would say there's very little in the way of brand new functionality. It's almost entirely about just making it a little bit easier for people to do stuff. OK. It seems like Conduit has a lot of libraries um, growing around it f that deal with networking, 
whereas pipes has more libraries that focus on uh, parsing, byte string parsing, dealing with with uh, lower level non networky sort of con consumption. Is that do you think a, a historical accident, or is some there's there's something about the libraries that make one better at, at one thing versus the other? I guess for conduit, it's largely driven by its use in a web server, so that might explain why it's it's good at networking. Well, one thing I would throw in, correct me if I'm wrong, Gabriel, a lot of the libraries that you've seen in the conduit world couldn't have existed in the pipes world until recently. That's correct. The fact is, without the leftover support, being able to write a bunch of parsing libraries just couldn't happen. So that could be one of the motivating factors in what you're seeing right now. And it could be now that pipes parse is maturing and becoming a, you know, becoming a solution that people are able to learn, understand, and use, that situation could change. So Gabriel, what do you think of the argument uh, that uh, Conduit takes to put more into the core for, I guess, ease of use and understanding versus the approach you take with pipes of keeping the core um, minimal and adding things on in separate libraries? So I prefer to keep pipes minimal so that people can build other things on top of it that I may not have intended. An example of this is you can use pipes to implement Python or Ruby style generators. Well, as a conduit, there'll be a tiny bit of a mismatch. For example, in a conduit, there's no way to uh, to forbid await statements. Whereas in pipes, because of the bidirectional stuff, you can actually typefully prevent and await things. So you get a much more accurate model of generators. Also, with pipes, so like pi one of the, some of the pipes laws actually correspond to generator laws, so like for loop laws, generator laws, and you can't prove those same laws. At least, so maybe you could, but uh, it would be much more difficult to prove those same laws for conduit. And so I like to keep pipe simple so that people can take the library places that I didn't originally envision. And, and so I also, the second reason I try to keep it simple is that most pipes extensions are, do have no like actual pipes integration. So like the three core pipes libraries, which are pipes safe, pipes concurrency, pipes parse, oh, sorry, there's a fourth one, pipes group, which is the recent free T based stuff. Those four libraries do not have any pipe specific bits in them. At least the, the core idioms are proud they work. And so, for example, Conduit can reuse some of those idioms. So like the free T stuff, Conduit could reuse. Uh, in theory, the pipes part stuff, Conduit could do too, but it already has its own parsing mechanism. Pipe safe is basically like resource T, and there's some discussion about having uh, just replacing pipes with resource T, uh, for example. And pipes concurrency has a, p the core mechanism is totally pipes independent. It's just like two functions in there are, are just thin pipes wrappers on top of it. And so by keeping those, th those functionalities separate from the core pipes library, you can reason about how they work without even understanding how pipes work specifically. You, you mentioned, uh, and you mentioned in the pipes tutorial, the bidirectional capabilities of pipes. They're also kind of buried deep in the core where maybe people won't necessarily use them. What, what is the use case for them that, that you have seen or that you foresee? So the reason that there's no tutorial, there was a tutorial, but I got rid of it just because people were complaining about the complexity of the library. So I just sort of tucked it under the rug for now, and I'm waiting until I can write a better tutorial. Uh, but the main functionality for bidirectionality is, uh, one, you can parameterize requests for input. So like, if you just do a wait and you say, like, give me a byte string, you can't really tell it about what you want. Like, you can't say, give me n bytes, or give me a byte string up to this character, for example. Whereas if you can pass it an argument, then you can, uh, you can be more specific about what you actually wanted. Another example is like if you're trying to model an RPC-like interface, you'd like to be able to pass some argument to that call. So that's, that's on the await side. And on the, on the yield side, the dual of that for bidirectionality is that you can have yield return an argument. So like maybe just a status code saying how it went when you yield the value. Uh, those are the primary use cases. So I mean, I've been trying to, to not use it as much as possible because there's a a, a big step in complexity once you start going up to bidirectional things. So I avoid the. So I try to work around it as much as possible and only use it if strictly necessary. But pipes uses that in the in the core to uh, to enable. Yes, okay. that's correct. Yes. So Gabriel, you mentioned free T a second ago, and my ears always prick up when I hear <laughs> algebraic or category theoretic, theoretical tools being employed, especially in uh, what seems like very pragmatic libraries. Uh, so what's the purpose of free T? I understand that free monads are basically monads with a trivial join operation that just sequences 
whatever sequences computation, if you will, rather than actually performing computation. Uh, what, what's the use of free T in pipes? So free, uh, so for pipes specifically, free T is a way to insert boundaries in a stream to like mark logical units. So for example, let's say you have a stream of files and you just want to mark where one file it begins and the next, and where one file begins and ends and the next file begins, for example. And by doing by inserting boundaries this way, you can then provide lots of operations for operating on these boundaries at a very high level. For example, like the pipes. So if you combine like lenses with free T, you can get code in pipes that literally reads like if you want to take the first ten lines of a file, you would just say over lines takes ten. And that's like the code to take the first ten, and it'll run in constant space. Doesn't work. Doesn't matter if you have infinite lines, whatever. It, it works because these boundaries don't actually demand the entire line or file or logical unit. They're just sort of part of the stream. Very interesting. Do you find are there other uh, hidden mathematical tools under the hood of pipes that you've found useful? Um, so pipes is itself a free T, uh, basically. <laughs> Conduit, too. Um, so, but I'd say the, the most useful thing that I'm contemplating but haven't fully thought out yet is, uh, so this is related to pipe safe not being sufficiently prompt, as Michael has mentioned before. And so I've been talking, I've been thinking about, like, making abstraction on top of pipes that uses free categories so that you can syntactically uh, tell when it's terminating and then insert uh, finalization points in the correct place. That's a, uh, I would have a very difficult time uh, articulating that within a couple of minutes. So that's the, that's the one thing that's on my mind recently. Uh, there's also, of course, like the use of lenses. I think lenses are really beautiful, and everyone listening to this should learn about them because they are really revolutionary. Other than that, that's it. Michael, what about you? Do you have you found any any interesting mathematical concepts that that fit into conduits and have, have made your work with conduits better or or given you some nice reasoning tools or things like that? I would say that the that the stuff that we ended up inheriting from pipes is probably as far as I've gone on that. So conduit definitely does is not a category. It was never set up to be a category, but with the inspiration of pipes, we've definitely went in the direction of getting it towards a category. So if you if you gut out finalization and you turn off leftovers, you get a full category. If you turn on leftovers, then you have to use two different composition operators in order to get the category. So it's not technically a category, but it's pretty darn close. Mm -hmm. uh, so so realizing those kind you know realizing and trying to take advantage of those kinds of structures has definitely been a step forward for conduit. Realizing, if you look at some of the original code, you had to really think about where you were going to be doing the composition. These days, you still have to think about where you're going to do composition, but that almost always is just because you're worried about efficiency. Uh, there's very, there are very few times where, you know, in fact, no, there is, there is no case where you have to deal with parentheses, and that's going to affect what your stream is doing. It's just an efficiency matter dealing with rewrite rules, for the most part. You should ask uh, Edward what categorical object your your conduits form <laughs> and he'll probably tell you it's a it's a left a semi near category or something. <laughs> <laughs> what was I was talking, one of my coworkers is John Weekly and we were talking about that a few months ago and he definitely I don't remember what he came up with, but he came up with something that he'd learned from that <laughs> Sounds reasonable. <laughs> yeah, anyone who hasn't seen it should check out cocommit.github.io, which is very fun. Yeah. Yes, it's amazing. So, <laughs> such monad. So, Michael, um, <laughs> you mentioned finalizers, and, and that seems to be a, a big sticking point. And uh, you brought up in in the documentation or on your blog, um, you know, running out of file descriptors. It sounded like something you actually ran into. Do you have a story behind that? It's not actually something I ever ran into, thankfully. Uh, but it's something that could easily be run into. I, I'll take that back. I have run into that, but that was just because of a library bug. Uh, file do, here's the issue. Imagine that you're writing a web server that's going to be serving files. So what you want to be able to do is you want to open up the file descriptor. You want to keep reading bytes out of that file at, on demand from the client. And then you want to close the file as soon as it's done. Uh, you're limited perhaps to 1024 file descriptors that you're able to have open at a time. So this web server is not going to be using very much memory. There's ba essentially no memory is going to be used. It's going to be holding in, you know, in memory 64K chunks for a very small amount of time for each connection. And so this web server should, in theory, scale up very quickly. 
But if you're dealing with lazy I.O., you have no guarantees about when that file descriptor is going to be closed. That's, that's the reason why the web servers have been going in the direction of avoiding lazy I.O. Uh, initially, a lot, of, a lot of the work that I did here was actually initially inspired by the Hyena library written by Johan. Uh, it was another. It was one of the first Iterity-based web servers, and that was very much the design goal. Some of the initial work that I did in Usode was based on a web frame, um, something I can't even think of the term for it, and a web interface called Hack. And Hack used Lazy I/O, and I definitely started running up against those kinds of problems. Uh, not so much that web servers were crashing; I hadn't hit that scale in my uh, my deployments yet. But it was very unnerving that I didn't know what was going to happen. Right. So having that control over side effects, and that's that's why we're using Haskell in the first place. So why not go all the way? Yeah, it sounds like being able to reason about when resources are finalized would be very important for a web server. So that might explain why Conduit has more of a focus on that than Pipes does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one, so there there are actually two aspects to resource management. One of them is promptness, and one of them is guaranteed. So guarantees about the resource management come down to exceptions. Like I, we were discussing earlier, as soon as you get coroutines into the mix, there's no way you can guarantee that an exception that an exception handler is going to get called. So that's why pipe safe and resource T both exist to abstract out or to factor out the resource handling beyond the level of coroutines. And I think that's really the only kind of solution that's going to work. This is also something that we learned from the enumerator world. In the enumerator world, you can only have a, you know, you can have a function like enum file, which guarantees that it will be exception safe and guarantees that it will promptly close the file handle. But you, and that's for producing data. But you can't do that on the consuming side. You have this, you have this split that the consuming side is a little bit less powerful because it's based on these coroutines. So in the conduit and the pipes world, both sides are equally powerful, which actually means they're both less powerful than what you have in the enumerator world. And therefore, you have to factor this out to some external component. Finalizers are the conduit answer not to the guaranteed finalization, but to the prompt finalization, which means that as soon as the resource is done being consumed, you're able to close it. So it, it seems like there is somewhat of a tension between promptness and streaming. So for instance, if you stream a file line by line, you have to wait to close that file descriptor once you've streamed the entire file but you have less memory usage. If you read the entire file and you can go ahead and close it, but then you're using more memory than you need to. So how, how does Conduit balance that? Well, that's actually a great point, that's a, and it's a great way to frame it. Uh, the fact is that Conduit is based around the idea of using as little memory as possible, primarily, and closing the resources as soon as possible. So it's in that order. So in the case you gave, it will use little memory, and it will keep that file descript in open. It's up to the, frankly, it's up to the user to determine if they're in a situation where, for some reason, it makes sense to change that order. Mm -hmm. And frankly, at that point, I would probably tell people not to use Conduit. If you have a situation where you just need to open up a file, read all the contents, and then close the file, data.bytestring.readfile does exactly that, and you don't incur any of the overhead. So in the Conduit world, I love Conduit. I'm very happy programming in Conduit. But I also don't think it's, you know, it's, it should be a solution for every single use case. If you have a use case which can be handled in constant memory or uh, can be handled in memory, there's really no point in using a streaming data library. Uh, Gabriel may disagree with me on that one, but that's my feeling on the Conduit side. Uh, Gabriel, before you respond to that, I mean, feel free to, but uh, how does Pipes Safe deal with this uh, problem of finalizers and, and guarantees? So pipe safe is very similar to resource T. It guarantees determinism, but not promptness. And there used to be some limited support for promptness in pipes, but I took it out because I could not, it was difficult for me to reason about, and it was difficult for me to provide any sort of guarantees about its behavior. It was like the example, in fact, the detention that uh, you that he just mentioned about like between closing a file promptly or finalizing a file promptly or reading its, all its contents in or not. Uh, that actually corresponds to the law violation I encountered when I was trying to set up this uh, set up uh, prompt this prompt violation, there's actually an identity law that if you violate leads to that issue, and I haven't found a good solution to that. So I so I generally have a policy that if I don't know how to implement implement something in a way that's easy to reason about, I just don't implement it uh, until I find a better solution. So I prefer to just wait until I come up with something better. And for right now, I only guarantee uh, determinism. 
And that sounds like I a very... Go ahead. No, no. Well, I'd, I'd throw in that this is a perfect example of the, of, the tension, of the difference between pipes and conduit. Conduit has a test case, which is currently commented out, which says, we need, basically says, that problem that Gabriel just described, we need to figure out a way to solve it. Until then, we don't have, we don't have guaranteed ordering of finalizers. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think we're talking about the same law violation, depending on the way that you do the association. So, so that, there's two. That's one of them, but yeah. Yeah, yeah so on the conduit side, the, the primary issue is we have to guarantee prom promptness. And if that means we aren't able to give guarantees about the, fi the finalization order, and therefore the category instance isn't, therefore there isn't a category, so be it. Because the primary goal is the pragmatism. I, it's an important dis uh, distinction between the two libraries. So it's, it's, it sounds like there is a, an almost philosophical difference between the two of you in your, the way, what you prioritize for the library. It sounds like Gabriel prioritizes correctness a bit more versus where you may prioritize um, pragmatism a bit more and say, well, this is mostly the functionality we need. It may not have beautiful properties yet, but it gets stuff done. I, I would re I'd phrase it just a little bit differently, which is the correctness that we need for the, for the use cases that I've seen, the correctness that I need is actually the guaranteed finalization and the prompt finalization. Mm -hmm. So having a nice category law would be wonderful. I'm not opposed to that. Right. That every single time we add another mathematical law to the library, it becomes better. But the primary case that we have, the library would be broken if we couldn't give prompt finalization. Sure. And I, I just, I, I see this tension come up a lot in Haskell, and it's one of the only languages or, or communities I'm familiar with where people will sometimes say, well, I could do this, but it would be a little bit broken, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> like, it would work, but it wouldn't be nice. So... And I, I remember Simon Peyton Jones talking about how for, for most of its early history, Haskell was a useless language because they just couldn't do I.O. right, so they didn't bother. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about the future, uh, starting with you, Gabriel. Where, where do you see pipes breaking down? What, what, what does it still need? And then we can talk to Michael about it as well. So right now we're getting close to finishing the last uh, key library that I wanted in the Pipes ecosystem, which was uh, Pipes Text. And so that was sort of like the so the key libraries that I wanted to do is I wanted to get parsing like squared away uh, completely in order to feel like I at least cover that angle. Uh, key upcoming libraries that we're working on one is uh, XML support that's very heavily demanded. Uh, also Pipes based server Jeremy Shaw is working on that. And my personal pet project is a model view control library, which has some relationship to pipes, specifically pipes concurrency. Uh, those are the three main areas of pipes research at the moment. It might help to talk a bit more about what that model view controller library does, because if people are thinking that it's a web framework, it is not a web wrong. framework. That's correct. Uh, <laughs> so model view controller is a way to structure concurrent applications so that all your application logic is in one pure core. Uh, and so you basically use pipes concurrency so that you can take all your concurrent inputs, you group them into one input, you take all your concurrent outputs, you group them into one output, and then your model is a pure, basic, it's basically a, a pipe with state t, with a state-based monad. It's pure, it's quick checkable, and all your logic's in one place. And it's also composable, so you can then, you know, you can decompose that into subpipes and so forth. Uh, so it's just a way to, because I find that a lot of Haskell programmers right now are doing a lot of channel spaghetti for their concurrent applications, and that's sort of to combat that idiom. That sounds almost like FRP, or getting into the it, realm it, of It's not technically FRP, at least not the way Conal defined it, and I know if I say it's FRP, a lot of people will yell at me, so I call it MVC instead. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what kind of things would, would people write? Because I, I, I saw your, um, your, your post on the pipes uh, mailing list about MVC, and it sounded really interesting, but I wasn't exactly sure what people might do with it. I immediately thought, well, maybe you could use that as the engine for some sort of game yes, or so something game like that. Yes, so game programming is one of the target domains for that. The other, So another target domain for that would be, uh, so there's actually another pet library of mine, which is called RCPL. It's like REPL, except it's concurrent. And so you know, how many times do you write, you write a concurrent a a console application and you think, I want to print something to the console, but I don't want to clobber my input line. And so that's the motivation behind RCPL, and its core is actually is based on this MVC model. And you can actually quick check the core and prove certain properties about how it works. And Michael, Michael that cool. uh, same question for you, the, uh, the gaps and the future for Conduit. 
uh, I actually don't have very many plans at the moment for changing conduit. I wrote in a recent blog post that every few months or so I, I get some crazy idea and I decide I'm going to go off and try it out, but it never sees the light of day. Uh, that's happened probably about six or seven times since 1.0 came out. And I've yet to find, the, the closest I've come is the approach of, gutting, of taking finalizers out of the core. Uh, for the most part, I'm very happy with the, uh, with the balance that we have. Uh, there, are some, you know, there are some specific things that, that used to bother me, especially the issues of transpipe or hoist. Uh, you know, they, it only worked with the monad morphism. Uh, that, was, that was something that used to bother me quite a bit. But now with the new lift module, that problem's disappeared. So most of the annoyances that I've had over the past two years have faded away. I would say that the things that still bother me are uh, the fact that resumable source as its own data type exists at all, which comes from the fact that we have finalizers. And uh, other than that, I'm actually pretty happy with the library, and I'm not planning any major changes. One of the things I've learned from working on Yasode is that stability is a feature all on its own. So even if the library is at 95%, I don't necessarily want to get to 98% if it's going to mean that everyone's code is going to break. Great. And so this is to both of you. What haven't we talked about that's uh, either uh, important for these libraries or a big difference between them still? Well, the only other thing that I can think of is the fact that in the conduit world, you have one abstraction. And the one abstraction means that you can use a single set of AP, uh, functions all over the place. Uh, so the big example for this is that we have, in, the, in this recent uh, talk about leftovers, there is a function in the conduit core called isolate, which means I'm going to take up to n number of elements from upstream and pass them downstream. And that works whether you have leftovers, whether you don't have leftovers. It doesn't really matter. It just works. In the pipes world, you have to have a, a bunch of different functions, each one of them with a slightly different set of semantics. Or talking about the more concrete uh, example is that there are three different functions for getting a value from upstream. In the condor world, there's one. So in the condor world, we we don't have you know we don't have category laws. Wait, what's the third? I know draw and are you talking about like request versus await? Take, take, draw, and await. Wait. Oh, so hey, just continue. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, wait. When you when you write a fold, when you write a fold in pipes. Right. Next. Sorry, next. Oh, next. Confused. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry about that. Uh, so so in the in the condor world, the way that you would say take the sum of a list, or the sum of a stream, is you would just connect a sync to it. In the pipes world, you have a different idiom. So I consider it a very strong feature of the library that you're able to do everything in this one. Let's put it this way. It's, that's the feature of having a monolithic library. It's true that we lose the ability to create a whole bunch of different functionalities, like Gabriel was describing earlier. But by having one monolithic core with a defined feature set, you can do things, I think, in a much simpler manner. Yeah, and so I agree with Michael that you know, he, he likes the monolithic core. I tend to try to split things up in two layers, so you know you have the vanilla pipes layer, pipes and parses built on top of that, for example. Next, in theory, you can implement in terms of draw or vice versa, but it's like that's a minor distinction. Uh, for me, it's more important. So I sort of see like pipes being almost like a language feature, something that, like for example for loops, right? So pipe for loops, like you could conceivably see as being just a built-in for a, for a language, and that you build things on top of that. Just like generators are several language features, Pipes just provides a very clean implementation of generators that you can use totally independent of parsers or pipes. You can just use producers and fours, and you're done. Uh, so that's how I, I see Pipes being used as a very primitive low-level language construct that you build other things on top of, which is why I try to in include as few things in the core implementation as possible. So Gabriel, I'd, I'd like to ask you a question that, that I've been thinking about uh, in terms of stream processing, and this might uh, this might reveal some of my ignorance about the pipes library. But when you're writing consumers, do you, uh, for instance, if you want to do data aggregation and statistics on a stream, do you do you write? You can do that with, with a monoid, right? Because monoids allow you to accumulate values on the end. So yeah, this is a problem in documentation. So. Yeah, if you want to do, Pipes actually already has support for analytics, but it's not obvious for people who haven't talked to me. Uh, so the fold L library, and this is what I was mentioning to Michael, 
is structured in such a way that any library can interop, interop with it without actually incurring a dependency on fold L. So mm -hmm. if you write a function that takes basically uh, or that basically takes a left fold, you know, the step function, the beginning state, and then maybe a, the only difference is it also has a final extraction function. Mm -hmm. And then that function can be wrapped to accept a fold from the fold L library. And these and so you can then so fold L is based off a post I wrote, which is in turn based off of another post called beautiful folds, mm -hmm. which is about being able to fold a stream in one pass, constant space, no space leaks. Uh, but be able to accumulate multiple statistics about that stream. Right, and you can you can do that. Huh? One way that you could do that would be with uh, with a a product monoid, not product in the sense of multiplication of integers, but a product in the sense of a product type composed of of monoids. Right. So, for instance, you can create a standard deviation monoid. Yeah. So, for example, you like let's say you want to write a standard deviation, right? So in foldl, what you could do is you have one fold which takes, in this case, the sum, and you have another fold which takes the the sum of squares, mm -hmm. right? And then you know the, you know the standard deviation formula it's the sum squared minus the sum of squares, mm -hmm. and maybe the square root of that. And you can actually just write that in applicative style. So you would just say the applicative. You would basically say, uh, I cannot. This is one part where operators are very uh, do not lend themselves well to podcasts. But in applicator style, you could combine those two folds to make a standard right. deviation. It would run in constant space over the list, no space leaks, and everything. So, so that what, gives an idea. what you could do if you were just processing a list, for instance, is you could make so for instance, mean is a sum and account monoid. Right. Right. The product of those two standard yeah. deviation, like you're talking about, they're, they're, yeah. and then you can fold all of those together. You can Lots of different things form mon monoids. I was surprised. Yes. Bloom filters form monoids. Apparently, hyperlog log. Hyperlog log. 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 Terms of monoids too. Yeah. Is, yeah. So you can write your write it. You could even just write a new type that is a tuple of all of the monoids you care about. Exactly. Derive monoid and then just fold map, right? So I, actually, what we end up doing is we just write one fold for each uh, statistic we're interested in, and then we just use applicatives to combine them mm -hmm. into one statistic. So we, I find that's just easier. Sure. And so the advantage of doing that versus doing it at the monoid level is that at the monoid, usually you have to also provide an extraction function. Like with the average, you have to not only compute the sum and the count, but you also need to provide like a final last step, which is to divide one by right. the other. Right. You the, so if you combine them at the full level, you can also combine their extraction functions too automatically. Mm -hmm. Is there an example of that in your blog post? or? Yes, there's an example of that in the blog post. Cool. So uh, yeah, just Google Haskell for all composable streaming folds, and you'll find the post. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's all I got. Chris, do you yeah, have anything I was else? gonna I was gonna give you guys a chance. We would love to bring you on individually in the future uh, in another episode, but since that could be a little while, um, is there anything that you wanted to just point out that that's of Current interest in the uh, in the Haskell community uh, for all the listeners. I will just plug Lens again. Lens is an amazing library. They think will transform Haskell programming the same way Monads did. And anybody who's a little bit reticent about learning Lenses should just take the leap, uh, find some Lens tutorials. It's a really fantastic library. It's not just about accessing data. You can do very much more with it and program at a very high level. That's my two cents. Michael? Yeah. Okay. If we're going to talk about if we're talking about lens, I'll talk about the uh, the flip side, which is mono traversable, which I think it factoring out everything else for mono traversable, mono foldable, I think is actually a very interesting improvement on foldable itself, just because it allows a whole bunch of new instances and writing more more efficient versions of various functions. Uh, I've had a lot of fun using mono foldable recently, not as a new I guess you could see it as an alternative to Lens, which is why Gabriel's comment just reminded me of it. For the most part, I've just used it as a companion to Lens. Uh, when you just want to be able to continue using simple functions like MapM and not think about you know, exactly which kind of traversal or which kind of fold you want to use, uh, I found monotraversable to be very nice. Uh, I'm, I'm very much considering how that can tie in better with the Lens world, though, as I'm, I don't consider myself a Lens aficionado by any means. But I'm trying to get there. Okay. Yeah, back to you, Rain. If there's anything else uh, before we start wrapping up. 
No, I think I'm good. I'm just really happy you both came on today. It's been a lot of fun. We, it was a pleasure for us, too. Awesome. Yeah, thanks again, guys. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, talk us out here. Let's see. You've been listening to the Haskell Cast, Episode 6, recorded on Sunday, February 23rd, 2014, with guests Michael Snoyman and Gabriel Gonzalez. For notes and links from this podcast, visit www.haskellcast.com.